<clears throat> Hi, thanks for, thanks for checking in. Um, I'm Ted Peterson, and I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and I've been here since the fall of 1999, so back in the last century, last days of the 20th century. And today is April 24th, uh, 2016. So it's been um, some years now. And um, uh, my research uh, during all that time has been in natural language processing and computational linguistics and has specifically dealt with um, semantics, word meanings, uh, finding out how related concepts are to each other, discovering uh, new meanings of words automatically, uh, many interesting problems like that. And my goal here today isn't really to talk about those problems, but more so to talk about how it is I came to this point where, I, where, where this is what I work on. And it's not, it's not really how I came to this place, um, but more so uh, how is it that I work on these problems in natural language processing. And it's been quite a while now. Um, I came here to UMD uh, with that as my uh, research agenda. And as a PhD student um, at Southern Methodist University, uh, it was pretty consistently what I was focusing on. Um, I started um, working in more kind of AI-based approaches uh, with John Sullins, and then um, worked a little bit in logic programming in NLP uh, with Wei Dong Chen, and um, and then uh, uh, worked uh, uh, then for the rest of my time with um, Rebecca Bruce uh, and focusing on statistical methods of natural language processing and uh, in particular probabilistic methods of discovering word senses. Um, and so that was a pretty uh, consistent focus, at least in terms of the general problem I was interested in. And so clearly by that time, by the time I was a PhD student, I had that as an idea. Um, and so if we go back one more step, uh, to um, when I was a master's student at the University of Arkansas, that's where I do distinctly remember identifying NLP as a problem. And um, in particular, what, what kind of fascinated me at that point was the problem of machine translation. That is, how do you take input in one language and automatically translate it into another? And that is the problem that I think natural language processing, anyone who works in natural language processing, uh, loves that problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's the holy grail, if you will, of, of natural language processing. And I think it's pretty common for people to get into natural language processing given some kind of interest in translation or some kind of goal of translation. Um, what we quickly learn is that translation is a hugely complicated problem. And so one master's student at the University of Arkansas in the early 1990s um, working on an IBM PC um, it, it has a limited opportunity to develop a full solution to machine translation. Um, but at that time, uh, I had identified translation as the problem I wanted to do my master's uh, project on. And so I worked on a, a, a really essentially a program that would translate from Spanish to English and focused on uh, stock market reports, actually. And uh, I, it was very crude and simple, but um, it, it was also a kind of genuine uh, sort of experience and project. It was something I was quite interested in and um, really wanted to work on at that time. And what really appealed to me during that period was the realization that many of the ideas that we learn about in uh, compiler theory and formal languages uh, that is having to do with parsing and finding the structure of either formal languages or programming languages uh, can be applied with some success to human language. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, you know, I wrote uh, programs that would uh, create parse trees from one language and then convert those trees into the other language um, by moving things around to reflect certain uh, differences in, in word and structure ordering between the languages. And there were, it was a whole lot of kind of special case uh, uh, um, uh, exploitation on my part. Uh, but it was, a, it was a fun and satisfying problem and, and, and taught me at least that translation is a very big problem and one must narrow one's focus. 
um, uh, to, to make any success, uh, or to have any success with that. Um, what was amusing about that was that I was taking a compiler's class and I had this sort of flash of inspiration that, that these ideas that we're using to uh, parse and generate programming languages, what if we did that with human languages? And I thought this was my idea. I thought I came up with that, that you know, this was like my Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, or maybe whether it's unfortunate or not, I don't know. But I went to the um, I went to the University of Arkansas library, and I was kind of combing through the computer science um, uh, collection, all well, maybe two shelves of it or so, and um, came upon a book about machine translation that um, more or less described the idea that I had pretty exactly, and I could see that it was from years ago. And I could see that, in fact, people had been working on machine translation since um, really the earliest days of computing. It was, it was really uh, one of the first problems that, uh, computer, um, that, were, that computers were used to tackle, which is kind of staggering to think about, um, given the, the, the primitive nature of the, of the hardware available at that time. Um, but indeed, that's, that's the case. It was an important problem. People wanted to solve it. They've always wanted to solve it. And I was no exception. Um, and so when I think about that, I see that moment you know, in compiler class, and then going to the library, finding the machine translation book. And, and, and that's clearly a moment that was important. But it doesn't answer the question of why was I thinking about that? And um, why was that even something I was thinking about? Computer science is a big field. There are lots of things you can be thinking about. And I was taking all different kinds of classes, um, you know, classes in programming languages and compilers and operating systems. And uh, I don't even think I took a class in AI, certainly not NLP. Um, and so there wasn't really any direction there that led me to this particular area. But there was something that I had absorbed um, in my life, apparently, before that time, that led me uh, led me to that sort of uh, sequence of events, and so so I've been thinking about that lately, and I've been want you know I've 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 when I've thought about how I got to this point, the story often really just begins at that moment as a master student at the University of Arkansas, uh, but the truth is that leaves unanswered how why did that happen then. And so, and so I've spent some time thinking more about that, and I think it, it was really a few different things before that. And a lot of it had to do with studying language and studying foreign language. And it is something that has clearly had a kind of formative influence on my life and thinking. And so um, I'm a great believer that all of us should be studying, uh, you know, foreign languages, um, you know, throughout our lives. And I've I've tried to uh, I've tried to do that off and on with varying degrees of success, but that process really began um, for me in high school. Um, I lived in you know Columbus, Ohio, which at the time was maybe still you know very monolingual sort of community. So there was no necessity really to learn another language, but high school required it. Right? We were you know that was back in the times of the Cold War and probably the Reagan administration and also when high schools still required foreign language. I'm not sure that they still do or not. But um, in any case, it was a good thing. And my high school gave us a choice, I recall, of I think four languages. Um, and there were the big three, uh, which would be French, Spanish, and German, you know, kind of traditional offering. And the fourth was Russian, which today may seem a little esoteric. But it's important to remember that this was the time of the Cold War, and uh, there was no sign of it ending. Um, and so uh, as a uh, high school student, I was knowing that I had to study a foreign language. And I actually thought a lot about studying Russian, uh, because I was kind of maybe a pessimistic young man. And I, I thought perhaps the Russians uh, or the Soviet Union uh, would maybe come out on top, and I, you know, 
I'd have some advantage over my fellow uh, subjects or, um, if, if I could uh, speak the language of our um, overlords. And uh, so I thought about studying Russian, um, but, um, but then uh, my, my father actually, um, um, I asked him, and he had studied German uh, as, a, as a college student, I believe. And, and had a great, and still has, uh, I think, a great love of, of German literature. I would remember seeing um, books around our house, you know, by Kafka and uh, so forth. And, and I think that, that created some impression on me, and I think he also had mentioned, well, this is, you know, German has kind of historically been the language of science, and, um, uh, and I was interested in science. I knew that much, at least. And so German kind of made sense. Um, now, German was not among the more popular languages. The uh, French and Spanish were fabulously popular, and they were taught by kind of very um, sort of dynamic, almost sort of stereotypical French-Spanish high school teachers with lots of flair and panache and so forth. Whereas Russian and German were taught by a, a, a very dear man, uh, quite a bit older than the other language teachers, rather somber, in which, you know, he was teaching German and Russian to 15-year-olds, so if anything's going to make you somber, that's probably it. And um, uh, so there were about four or five students in my German class, whereas in the French-Spanish classes, there'd be 25 or 30. And we would sit in a little circle, and uh, uh, our German teacher would kind of gaze upon us. He was a tall, tall man, uh, had difficulty fitting into the little student desk and was kind of lanky and, and was never quite properly shaven and he would just thinking about him makes me want to kind of curl up and you know go to sleep or something but but he worked really hard and he, he wanted us to both um, speak and understand the grammar of German and so we would have these sort of conversation sessions where we would repeat what he would say. And I remember very little of that because it was embarrassing. Um, he, he was very um, pronounced in how he um, used his mouth, which I guess you need to be with German. And so I, I, I remember so little of it, but I remember incessant repetitions of, of, of you know, like, ich bin müde and the lips just coming out like that. And he would insist that we did that and it just, was mortifying. And so that's all been kind of blocked out of my mind. Um, we also did a lot of grammar exercises, um, a lot of essentially um, uh, conjugating verbs and, and, and changing um, um, the structure of, of sentences. And as I realize and think about in retrospect, I learned how to do that, but without understanding it. So I could go in and turn a German statement into a question perfectly. I did that quite well. I also didn't really understand it. I could conjugate verbs. I could, I could change um, the, the, the structure of sentences very mechanically without understanding. And so um, I was a moderately successful student, um, you know, in terms of testing and so forth. But I had almost no understanding of German. And I, 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 I was self-conscious to the point where I couldn't speak it. And then I had performed the learning of the grammar and so forth in this very rote fashion that um, in the end, uh, after two years, um, I realized, my goodness, um, this doesn't make any sense. So, um, so that was kind of discouraging. Um, uh, I should also say that as I'm, as I'm, as I'm recounting this story about why I took German, uh, the other, I, I, I need to give credit to another place, and there was a, a wonderful uh, series on PBS, public broadcasting, uh, in the United States uh, when I was a, 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 young, a young lad uh, called Soccer Made in Germany, and this was hosted by uh, very great Toby Charles. And it was an hour-long program that would take highlights of a, of a match from the German Bundesliga and uh, show that. And Toby would sort of provide the commentary, you know, so this very British fellow was providing the commentary of these German matches. 
And at halftime or at the break, they would always have a um, feature where some aspect of German culture or life was presented. And this, I realized, had kind of a powerful impact on me for some reason. Um, part of it was I loved soccer. Uh, I played soccer with great enthusiasm, um, limited skill perhaps, but great enthusiasm. And I think I imagined perhaps that as a, a career path, I might be considering offers from you know professional leagues in Germany to play soccer. And I would need to be able to speak to my fans and their language so that I would be regarded as a kind of humble man, not a celebrity above the people, but, but rather a man of the people, the German people. And this was quite, uh, I really thought that. So um, as we can see, that's not quite how things worked out. Um, but all the same, that was among the motivations. And I, I think that's common enough. I think sometimes students, high school, college, we study things for all kinds of reasons. And sometimes the reasons don't really matter. Um, it's just important to study things, learn new things, and see where that takes you. And so if it was the combination of, of aspiring to a career in, in German soccer and my father having read a lot of German literature in, in college, well then, so be it. You know, that's, that's, that's how I got into high school German. So I made it through high school German, and I started my undergraduate uh, education at Ohio State in Columbus, uh, uh, the hometown school, if you will. And at that time, they as well had a language requirement. And so I thought, oh, OK, two years of German. That'll be a breeze. Um, I signed up for um, freshman German, if you will. And it was a, whole, a, a wholly humbling experience to realize that I, I really didn't know anything. And that has a lot to do with this um, process by which I tried to learn. And you know what? In my college German classes, it was kind of the same. Um, we would do exercises, and I would memorize the rules. Okay, I memorized the rules, and I applied the rules with great skill, and I did okay. I was a, like a B student through three quarters of, of college German. Um, and yet, I couldn't come up with original spontaneous sentences on my own. Uh, we would sometimes uh, have these little conversational outings. Uh, there was a uh, place, uh, the Rathskeller, I think it was called on campus at, uh, at Ohio State, and we would go there and uh, some of the braver students, or older students actually, uh, would, uh, uh, well no, the drinking age then was 18, so they weren't older, but they were braver for sure. They would order some kind of beer, and, uh, and then the rest of us would sort of sit around and mumble. And, uh, and I, I distinctly remember falling back on, you know, ich bin müde, uh, which means something like I'm tired, you know, and then people would say, oh, I'm sorry, you know. And so, um, so really three years of studying German. And I remember at the time feeling like I should know more than this. I mean, I studied math for three years, and I went from algebra to, to trigonometry, to calculus. I mean, those are big jumps. Three years of German, and I was still, you know, you could parachute me down into Munich or Berlin or whatever, and I would be making hand gestures and, you know, finger art or whatever, um, and probably unable to say much. And so that experience stuck with me, and it, it may not seem connected at all to this overall narrative, but it turns out to be. Um, and so what happened? Well, when I became a senior in college, I had transferred uh, by that time to Drake University and had settled on computer science as a, as a major. Um, I got a BA in computer science, actually, because I had a hard time deciding. And I actually, in the end, was kind of flip-flopping between um, uh, fine art, drawing and painting, um, versus uh, computer science. And in a, a moment of, of um, what, sort of pragmatic yet uh, somehow sort of soul-crushing um, clarity, I realized um, that um, in computer science I could, you know, probably have a career and be successful and so forth. And life as an artist, um, well, you know, probably one ends up working in an art supply store or 
who knows what. Um, and, um, and so I opted for computer science, but I, I did take a lot of drawing and painting as well, which I'm, I'm grateful I did. And I'm glad that that university and that degree offered that. I think that was actually very important uh, for me. I think if I had been forced into a very sort of regimented computer science program, uh, I would have left it because I wasn't ready for that. Um, in any case, by the time I got to my final semester, I actually had free electives left. And this, you know, that this is a whole different era, right? We don't have as many free electives now as we did then. But I had some free electives left, and I didn't quite know what to do with them. And I decided that I would take Spanish. I would take a semester of Spanish. And why did I decide that? And as best I can recall, I remember having some conversations with a, 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 a classmate, not a classmate exactly, but someone I knew uh, who was, uh, I guess I admired, and he, was, he seemed smarter and wiser. And he kind of convinced me that the United States was going to go to war uh, in El Salvador and that we were going to get drafted. And so we had registered for selective service. That's something you did, and I assume maybe they still do that. I'm not sure. But we had registered for the selective service, and uh, I thought, I believe this guy. I thought, I'm going to El Salvador. And what do they speak in El Salvador? Well, they speak Spanish. And so I thought, well, OK, so if I'm going to be there as a soldier, it'll probably be good to know Spanish. you know. And uh, I, I didn't quite connect that experience with German. You know, how was I going to learn enough sp uh, Spanish in a semester to, um, you know, effectively rule over a small country in Central America? Um, but anyway, I decided to take Spanish, and it was a whole different thing. Uh, there was a, a, a very small, dynamic uh, professor from, I think, Argentina, uh, who marched into the class the first day and started speaking in Spanish. I never heard her speak English. Never. She refused to speak English, and we all looked just beaten. Um, I, I mean, just that first day, I remember, we were just dumbfounded. We, you know, and, and a few of the braver students raised their hands and said, this is the first semester Spanish class, not, you know, like fifth year Spanish. And, you know, you know and she was, si, yo sé, yo sé. And, um, and she continued like that. And it was tremendously frustrating because most of the time I didn't feel like I could understand her. And, and she would put us in these situations where we, would, we had to talk. We had to, we had to give a command to, give, to get someone to give us a pencil, for example. And it was traumatic. It took, it took so long to get a pencil. And we weren't allowed to do hand motions or, or whatever, uh, or certainly not English. And it was just a constant headache and yet I went because I wanted to graduate I needed that free elective I cursed myself uh, at times for signing up for Spanish what was I thinking you know if I'm gonna go to war that's the last of my worries um, and uh, uh, and I, I finished that class and was I felt relieved actually and um, graduated and uh, really felt like, boy, this is another unsuccessful venture in language. But then, um, upon graduation, I had, I had a job at Shell Oil um, in, in Houston, uh, Texas. And I was, a, I was an assembly language programmer. And I was, I was not just an assembly language programmer. I was an IBM 370XA um, assembly language programmer. So if that means anything to you, then... Um, I'm probably one of the youngest people still alive who can actually say that they were paid to write assembly language code for the 370XA. In any case, um, Houston, then as now, was not a monolingual community like Columbus uh, or Des Moines, which is where Drake University is. Uh, uh, Houston was dynamic, multilingual, multicultural, very different, uh, very exciting. And you heard Spanish. You heard a lot of Spanish on the radio, on the street, um, in the stores. And as I was there, oddly enough, I realized I understand some of this. And it was something, it was a feeling, it was, it was an, an enormously shocking feeling to suddenly realize 
I'm understanding what people are saying in another language. Now, I'm not understanding everything, and I'm maybe only understanding a little bit, but being able to understand a little bit of, of spontaneous conversation in a store or a restaurant was startling to me. And I thought, huh, how did that happen? And I looked for all kinds of explanations, you know, maybe it was like uh, because I was older when I was studying Spanish, or maybe I, you know, maybe I was, I was misremembering how bad my German was, maybe I could understand German like that and things like that. And it took me quite a while to realize that it was the approach that was taken that made it possible for me to understand actually. And so instead of this very strict rule-based method that I had for German, I had a much more sort of immersive, um, empirical experience with Spanish. Um, and now if you know much about natural language processing or NLP, you know kind of the, the, the story that I'm painting here. Uh, we, we have now in AI and natural language processing many different methods, and there are some broad categorizations we can make. And certainly rule-based methods and traditional methods of artificial intelligence are one class of problems and, and or class of solutions and methods, but they have generally been found not to scale very well. Um, and so most of what is done today uh, are, are much more empirical data-driven approaches. And so if you will, my Spanish experience was empirical, data-driven. The German experience was rule-based and very um, methodical. Um, and for me at least, the empirical approach worked. Um, and so I began to take Spanish at um, Houston Community College, something I can't imagine, uh, you know, um, I, I couldn't have imagined that. Uh, but I started taking Spanish at Houston Community College, and those classes were similar to what I took um, German classes, although not as much, um, because the students were typically um, these were night classes, they were older students. They were often students who had grown up in Spanish-speaking families. Uh, you know, they, they may have been, you know, sort of the, the first generation of a, of a family uh, to be born in the United States. So their parents, grandparents may have been fluent Spanish speakers. They may have been sort of in between, and they felt insecure about the language and so wanted to study it more formally. Um, in fact, they spoke really good Spanish, but, you know, so it, 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 uh, it was a different kind of class. And I found again that by doing this kind of data-driven approach to Spanish, it was more satisfying and it allowed me to learn. Um, and so I began to listen to Spanish language radio. I began to attempt to read Spanish language newspapers, books. Uh, that is something that is still hard. I'm, I'm not tremendously good at reading, but speaking, you know, uh, isn't so bad. Um, the, this all took place during the time that I was working uh, in Houston and not really thinking much about graduate school or research or anything like that. And after a few years in Houston, um, I left and I, I took a job in Minneapolis at the Dayton Hudson Department Store Company um, and was a programmer again, um, a SAS programmer in this case, statistical uh, analysis uh, um, programming. And Minneapolis then, at least, was not quite the multicultural uh, hub that it, uh, that it is now. And so this um, interest in, in, in Spanish wasn't satisfied quite as much in the community, but I continued to take, I took a Spanish class at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. And so now it's interesting, as a professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth, I, I log into University of Minnesota Systems to get r the records of students I'm advising. And I, I can actually go back and get my old transcripts from the Spanish classes I took. There was two semesters I took a conversational Spanish class and I think a Spanish literature class. And those were again kind of far enough along uh, where it was not simply rote learning. And so again, I wasn't thinking about language or graduate study or research. I was thinking about language, but not language in the context of graduate study or computer science. I was a programmer who had some interest in Spanish and continued to pursue that. Um, and so once I realized uh, that a life as a programmer was not quite what I wanted, I decided to go back uh, to get my master's degree in computer science at the University of Arkansas. And when I was doing that, it was the usual thing of, I don't like working, maybe 
and I can you know figure out something while I'm a student at the University of Arkansas and um, I took you know traditional computer science classes and I also took Spanish classes and I and I and I took um, a number of very good Spanish classes and um, one of them uh, actually there was one professor there he was I think uh, he was from Costa Rica and was on a Fulbright scholarship or Fulbright exchange and um, his name was Alfonso Chase and he was a poet and he was oh god was he a poet um, you know he would come in and be kind of raging away as one imagined poets do and I don't think he knew how to speak English and so I was back to that Spanish class in uh, my undergraduate years where the teacher refused to speak Spanish. In this case, he really didn't know English. And so um, he could speak a little bit of English, um, but it wasn't an act. And so the class was conducted entirely in Spanish. And it was remarkable because I realized I'm kind of getting this. I'm kind of understanding that. Um, and so that planted in my mind this question of how is it I'm doing this? How is it I'm doing this? How am I able you know, to learn and go back and forth a little bit at least between English, you know, my native language, and Spanish, a language that I only started studying at, uh, what, you know, probably when I was about 20 or 21. And, and why am I able to do that and why didn't that happen with German? And this created some, you know, kind of questions that I was thinking about um, while I was taking the Spanish class, and I'm, I'm quite certain that it was that set of questions and that dynamic that set the stage for my realization in my compiler class that if we can parse and generate um, programming languages, we can achieve the same with human language. We can do the same, parse English, generate Spanish uh, with human languages. I'm convinced that has something to do with it. Now the fact that the compiler class was, was very much oriented towards rules, we would specify the grammars of our languages and, and I mean context-free grammars which are very well defined and so forth. I'm convinced that that's what led my um, my master's project work to be a very rule-based approach. So ironically enough, despite this realization that this kind of empirical immersive approach to language learning worked better, I used a rule-based approach in my master's project. Now the fact is that at the time I was doing this pretty much everything was rule-based anyway. This was 1991, 1992. So the empirical revolution was only just beginning in natural language processing. We can look back to, you know, there was work going on for sure at IBM and so forth with statistical machine translation, but still a lot of the tradition was rule-based and so I was kind of following along with that. Um, and I didn't quite make the connection uh, between empirical and statistical methods in my own experience until I was a PhD student and I found myself working on trying to get language to fit within logic programming which doesn't work. Uh, don't, yeah, just don't, don't do that. And um, when I began to pursue some of the empirical methods where we look at the frequency which things occur and try and build things up based on um, observing what properties of language tend to occur together, that worked a lot better and that made a lot more sense to me. And in the end, when I had the opportunity to do that kind of work with Rebecca Bruce, it was very, it was very satisfying. And it was um, satisfying to the point where it sort of set that agenda in my mind for, you know, for, for in, in a pretty clear way. And um, so, um, so wow. There. Um, so, 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 so the summarizing statement is, um, uh, I think if I had not studied German and Spanish, I might not be here before you um, talking about these particular things. Um, I'm convinced that had a large role in what I did with the knowledge that I gained in my compiler class. And so maybe the message is here, the message here is that um, among other things, um, for um, 
for, for students or people just in general, it's important to pursue what may appear to be kind of disconnected or unrelated areas because our minds are, are so remarkable in, in, in what we can associate and what becomes meaningful to us that we might take some of these experiences and put them together into uh, something that really defines what we do with a lot of the rest of our lives. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so that's the longer version of how I got to, to where I am today. Um, I um, um, apologize, uh, but I thank you. I, I thank you for making it at this point. I apologize if it if it wandered a bit, um, but um, but it it uh, uh, it's kind of a, a a good feeling in a way to kind of be able to look back and say, yeah, it was probably this combination of circumstances that led me here. Um, so um, thank you very much. And if you you know if you have any. Uh, you know, of your own thoughts or comments, I'm always interested in that, and I think these are really interesting kinds of things to be thinking about and talking about. So, thanks. <laughs>